Society 13 Podcast Network. Redefining podcasts. Do you like to listen? While the light outside is getting dark, and my hellhounds howl and bark, the ghosts and demons float on through to frighten, scare, and terrify you. The host voice cheerfully float and bubble, discussing haunts and histories that will give you trouble. They are kind and caring, I will admit, though sometimes murders they can commit. Deaths occur when tongues are foreign, but that does not stop them from their fabulous decorum. Perfect we cannot expect them to be, especially when they bring the show to you and me. With a little help from us EPs, great content is brought to you, you see. So if you like what you have heard, I encourage you to spread the word. You, my dear, have great power to bring the light to the witching hour. With little as three cents a day, you can help the ghosties play. That warning to not tempt the spirits, if you donate, you shall hear it. So here's that question for you, my friend, when you've stayed to listen to the end. Do you choose to run or hide? That, my friend, is for you to decide. History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this 195th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. On this episode, we are bringing you Summer Wind Mansion, which is slash was located in Land Lakes, Wisconsin. And the reason why we say was is because it is no longer standing. This was suggested to us by Joshua Chairs, and he is publicist for Summer Wind Restoration Society. And he put us in contact with Craig Nairing, who's founder of the Fox Valley Ghost Hunters and co-founder of the Summer Wind Restoration Society. And he'll be joining us in just a little bit to share the history and hauntings of this location. So what did you think of the little poem that Shelby did there? I thought it was good. Very, very good. Very original. Thank you so much for that intro, Shelby. We appreciate it. We'd like to welcome to the Spooktacular crew, Sarah with an H. Hey, Sarah with an H. Rachel. Hello, Rachel. Christy. Hey, Christy. Dorothy with only one O. Hello, Dorothy with one O. Steph. Hello, Steph. Anna. Hello, Anna. Sarah Elizabeth. Hi, Sarah Elizabeth. Chris. Hey, Chris. Bobby. Hey, Bobby. Laura. Hi, Laura. And Amanda. Hello, Amanda. And now, this moment in oddity. The Hoover Dam was originally known as Boulder Dam when it was built to lock in Lake Mead at the Black Canyon of the Colorado River. It is a concrete arch gravity dam constructed from 1931 to 1936 and provided hundreds of jobs during the Great Depression. The dam was dedicated on September 30, 1935 by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Over 100 men lost their lives while building the dam. The United States government sent in the Bureau of Reclamation to do geological surveys before the construction began. J.G. Tierney was working for the survey aboard a barge on the Colorado River. He accidentally fell overboard and drowned. He is considered the first death in association with the dam. This happened on December 20, 1922. The dam was nearly completed when the last death to occur during construction happened. 
This death took place 13 years to the day of J.G. Tierney's on December 20th, 1935. A young man working on one of the massive intake towers fell to his death. This event was not only bizarre because of the date, but because the young man who died was Patrick Tierney. So the first and last death associated with the Hoover Dam occurred on the same day, 13 years apart, and involved the father, J.G., and his son, Patrick, which certainly is odd. And now, this month in history. In the month of April, on the 1st, in 1865, during the Battle of Five Forks, General George Pickett was defeated, hastening the end of the Civil War. General George Pickett was a Confederate general who's famously known for the disastrous Pickett's Charge during the Battle of Gettysburg. He also was known for executing deserters, which he did at the Battle of New Bern in 1864. He ordered 22 Confederate deserters executed there. The Battle of Five Forks took place in Virginia, and Pickett was cut off, which sealed the fate of Confederate General Robert E. Lee's armies at Petersburg and Richmond. Pickett feared prosecution for his execution of deserters and temporarily fled to Canada after the Civil War ended. He came back to America in 1866 and died in Virginia in 1875. It is said that he was a bitter man who dwelt extensively upon the loss of his men at Gettysburg. Summerwind Mansion is a ruined mansion in Lando Lakes, Wisconsin. It dates back to the early 1900s and served as a fishing lodge originally. Later, the Lamont family would turn the lodge into a mansion. It changed ownership several times until it finally burned to the ground in 1988. The mansion has a deep history of haunting activity to the point that it is considered one of the most haunted locations in Wisconsin. We are joined by Craig Nearing, who is the founder of the Fox Valley Ghost Hunters and co-founder of the Summer Wind Restoration Society. Craig grew up in Wisconsin near the Summerwind Mansion, and he joins us to talk about the history and hauntings of this location. How are you, Craig? I'm doing good. Thank you very much. We're very happy to have you join us. First of all, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Okay. I was actually born up in, uh, I was born in Milwaukee, but I moved up to Monaco area in northern Wisconsin when I was about six or seven years old, where my dad was building a house. Around that time, summer wind was up there maybe about 45 minutes from my parents' house. And as teenagers going to school, we used to go there all the time and find things that we couldn't explain. Of course, back then I was young and didn't wasn't really into the ghost hunting part of it, and th- there wasn't too many TV shows out there about it. I lived up most of my life up in northern Wisconsin, probably about 30 years or so. In 2005, I decided I wanted to move down to the Fox Valley and start a career in transportation driving semi. Oh, so I moved good. down. Yep, moved down here, and because there's not much to do up in northern Wisconsin to make a living unless you own your own business or have a resort or something. So moved down to the Fox Valley in 2005, and around that time, there's been so many shows on TV from Ghost Hunters to Taps to Ghost Adventures. And I said, hey, I told myself, I said, you know, I'd like to try to start my own team. So I worked it out to uh, getting a lot of team members, basically a lot of family members in the beginning. And then where is the best place to find uh Paranormal researchers, Craigslist. You can find anything you want on Craigslist. (laughs) Oh, really? So you got your researchers from Craigslist? (laughs) Yep, quite a few of them. Uh, The other ones uh, came to some of the tours that we did at different locations and uh, joined me on the team from there after they got a little experience. After a while, we started a website, and uh, we've been featured in everything from the Huffington Post to the Milwaukee Sentinel to radio shows throughout the world and even newspapers in faraway India. Well, that's great. So you had some experiences when you would visit Summerwind Mansion. Did you have any other kinds of experiences outside of that? We did as a team when we investigated there. I can get into that a little bit later. When I went there, 
as a young adult, just, you know, going there with schools, people on from the school, from us just hanging out, we would see shadows and uh, lights on in the in the mansion and there was no electricity. By that time, it was in ruins even in the early 1980s. Did you have an interest in the paranormal before all this? Like, you, did you grow up reading books about ghosts and such? Not really, no. It, it's funny. When my mom passed away when I was 26 years old from uh, cancer, I swear that I saw her sitting in a rocking chair and it rocked back and forth. And my friend who was there that night sleeping on the couch said that he saw it too. So it's like she was saying either goodbye or something. So my interest peaked a little bit then, but I still wanted to hang around my friends. I water skied for about 17 years professionally in the northern Wisconsin, so... Oh my gosh, that's really not something to take up in Wisconsin. <laughs> no, what? No, no, they only have the summers for that. It's a little chilly even then, I would think. Not too bad, but there was one time where I actually was out practicing on the lake water skiing while people were dressed in big heavy coats and it was actually snowing. Oh, jeez. Yeah, we're in Florida, so that just does not interest us at all. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I, I'm still I'm still kind of perplexed that he's, he had the holy grail of ghost hunting, which is a full-bodied apparition. He goes, and it kind of piqued my interest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being young, you don't, uh, you're, you'd rather hang out with your friends than do much else. And even at that time, there wasn't really any ghost hunting shows on TV or no, nothing really, and maybe Unsolved Mysteries or something like that, but nothing really to do with the paranormal. Well, Summer Wind Mansion is in Land Lakes, Wisconsin, and it dates back to the early 1900s. Why don't you tell us a little bit about its origins, who built it? Sure. In uh, 1912, actually, it was built. I'm not exactly sure who built it in 1912, but it was a fishing lodge and a place that you could stay overnight and go fishing out on the lake. I actually found a clipping from a newspaper article that you could stay there for $5 a night, 1912, 1913 era. In 1916, it was purchased by Robert Patterson Lamont, who would have been Secretary of Commerce under Hoover, who have actually been rumored to have stayed there. It's not confirmed, but it was rumored to have stayed there as well. And he actually redesigned the mansion into a bigger section of the mansion, adding on to it. I know at one point it stated it had 32 rooms. Now, from the looks of it, I don't know how it could have 32 rooms unless they're counting closets and, you know, like the basement and other rooms. He actually had it designed by architect Robert Talmadge and I forgot, Watson? Yeah, that was it. He had it for quite a while. The servants told him that uh, they thought the place was haunted and he didn't believe them. So one day while he's sitting down for breakfast, a ghost, an apparition of a woman in a white dress, long white dress with flowing black hair came up through one of the doors of the basement. So he pulled out his black powder pistol and fired two or three shots at the ghost, of course, hitting nothing. And those bullet holes actually remained in the doors all the way into the 1980s. Oh, wow, that is amazing. So here we have our woman in white. We always talk about how it seems like every location has their woman in white. So this one has its own. And he actually shot at it. So I'm assuming it must have had something about it that didn't look material since he decided to shoot. Yep. Wow. And there are some stories that uh, just recently I had come upon, um, and they're interesting as well, from a 90-year-old woman that lives across the lake that had some stories of when she used to go to Summer Wind when she was younger. And it's actually in my book, Wisconsin's Most Haunted, that I wrote. But we had interviewed someone that was close to her, and she had told us that the woman that was you know, now 90 years old, when she was a young girl, they, her and another friend decided they wanted to row over to that side of the lake to check out this really huge mansion that was built. She headed over there, and there's a really bad storm that had come upon them, and they were trying to, they were worried they were going to capsize and fall in. And they saw a lady in a long white dress, the same woman that was probably seen by Robert Lamont, waving at them to come to shore. So they came to shore, uh, got out of the boat, followed her up into the mansion. She brought them inside, set them down in the living room, and walked up the stairs and just appeared into the staircase, halfway up the staircase. Wow. So she was pretty real looking that she actually interacted with them. So it's not residual and had them come into the house. And, and obviously they thought she was real because they followed her in. Followed her in. Um, I didn't hear of any communication that was you know, said by any, either party, just that she waved them on in to follow them up into the mansion to take shelter from the storm. I heard that she and her friend were so scared that they ran out of the house, and by that time it had stopped raining. They got in the boat and rowed their boat across the lake as fast as they could. (laughs) I almost feel like they should uh, do rounds. (laughs) Row row, row your boat. But they were uh, curious, so the next day they decided to come back over there and row back over there. Only this time the lady in white was on the shore waving them away, and they were like perplexed of why she would do that. 
but they got back and found out a couple days later that one of the uh, hired help was, I don't know, off his rocker, so to speak, and started firing at all the people on the property with a gun. He didn't kill anybody, but basically she was trying to tell them to stay away to save yourselves. Wow, that is really fascinating. So you've got not only that they saw her twice, because for most of us, we're never even going to see a full-bodied apparition, and then to see it the next day, and to have her warning. Again, this is a very intelligent interaction that she understood that something here is dangerous, don't come. Yep. Do you know, before this was a fishing lodge, since it was built like a mansion, was it supposed to be somebody's home before it was a fishing lodge, or was it always meant to be the fishing lodge to begin with? It was meant to be a fishing lodge and I think resort, and then, like I said, Robert Lamont had bought it and added on to it. Now, it was the very first, when he, when Robert Lamont bought it, he actually, it was the first mansion to actually have electricity, heat, oil heat for the heat, running water, and other stuff. The facilities that the normal mansions back in the early 1900s wouldn't have had. Okay, well, that's pretty fascinating because that was, you know, early 1900s to have all of that in your home was pretty, uh, kind of an elite thing. Oh, yeah, definitely. And in today's standards, I look at it and I'd be like, well, that's not really a mansion. But when you talk about it back then, it was a mansion. Now, how long did the Lamonts live there? The Lamonts lived there till not long. I'd probably say about the early 50s. And it sat dormant for quite a while. It wasn't picked up till early in the 1960s to the early 70s. And who moved in after them? It's been when I looked at reports of the Summerwind Mansion, there's been like 30 different owners over this entire time frame. It's crazy. It's like nobody that can actually keep the property or they have something bad happen to them that they can't, uh, you know, keep it afloat. Um, it was actually purchased in the 70s by the Hinshaws, and they had a lot of uh, crazy stuff happening to them from flickering lights, disembodied voices in the house that they heard. They found a crawl space behind a dresser where they couldn't get into. So they asked their younger daughter named April to crawl in behind there and take a peek inside. So when she had crawled in there, she came out screaming, saying that there was a corpse inside the wall stuffed in the bag that still had black hair dangling from the head. Now, it was never reported to the police, and supposedly when they went back in there, it was gone. Wow, you almost wish that they had pulled that out of there because, of course, since you mentioned black hair, I'm wondering if it was female. (laughs) Wow, that's interesting. Whenever people say that some of these homes go through a lot of hands and we know that they have these hauntings going on, it does make you wonder if it's just that people didn't want to live there for very long or if they ran out. But because this wasn't something you'd talk about, they didn't tell people that's why they left. Yeah, no, definitely not. They had other instances where cars would start on fire and for no reason and and appliances would stop working, brand new ones, and then they'd start up again. Well, and I think I'd heard that the Hinshaws, because they were so frustrated with the windows opening and closing all the time, did they nail them shut? Yeah, they did. Wow. (laughs) Oh, I can't even imagine. Now, did they ever see this black-haired woman apparition? No, they actually actually didn't, no. I wonder where she went to since they didn't see her. That's interesting. Yeah, there was, now talking to the current owners, they had told me that when they purchased the mansion in the early 80s, um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but when they had purchased the mansion in the early 80s, they found shackles in the basement in the wall, like somebody was shackled up down there. Now, there are rumors of a woman named Lucy, and I, I can't find out. She wasn't Robert Lamont's wife, but there's rumors of a woman named Lucy who, for some reason, had an affair and her husband shackled in her basement a summer wind and left her there. Now, I'm not sure certain if that would have been the woman in white, but I'm not sure to what date that proceeds, if it is real. Well, it certainly isn't something that the family, I think, that uh, for him, his family would want to report. If he was keeping his wife down in the basement, they definitely would keep that under wraps. Yep. So in the 80s, so we go from the Hinshaws to this family, and probably there were a bunch of people in between there. Did anybody own this after those people in the 80s? What happened with Henshaw's was her husband, Arnold Henshaw, had an old organ in the house, and he actually would play the organ to all hours of the night. And the ghost told him he needed to play the organ or they wouldn't be happy with him. And he actually eventually went crazy, and Ginger tried to commit suicide. So they got rid of the house. They didn't want anything to do with it. But then suddenly, Raymond Von Bober, who happened to be a popcorn vendor from Milwaukee, and related to the Henshaws, wanted to turn it into a bed and breakfast. And he never actually lived on the property, 
but he had the same problems with the flickering light, disembodied voices, uh, things happening. Workers wouldn't stay on the job to help work on the house because they'd see things and run off. Now, Raymond Von Bober had a dream, a dream that a explorer named Jonathan Carver hid a deed in the property. Somewhere in the mansion, there was a deed to one-third of northern Wisconsin, which was a treaty from the Native Americans passed on to him. Now, Raymond Von Bober said that he needed to find the deed to basically satisfy Jonathan Carver, and that way the house would be good to live in. Well, we know whenever there's a haunting going on, one of the reasons why we look at history is because you try to figure out why it's haunted. And up to this point, we don't know. There hasn't really been anything specific about a murder there or somebody dying there. There might be a body that's been found in this crawl space. But now that you mention that, that does make you wonder because these hauntings seem to go back almost to the origin of the house being built. Is it something connected to that? Because we know when it comes to a lot of these native lands, there's a lot of bad feelings. And if you're thinking we have this hidden deed down here, that could definitely be an issue. Yeah, we did some digging into that quite a bit because I like to try to get to the bottom of things and see if they're really truthful or not. Now, based on Von Bober, he wrote a book called The Carver Effect, which is an interesting read. It's hard to find and mostly out of print, but he redid it and made some copies. It was actually, I got a copy that was signed by his son, which was kind of cool. But uh, Raymond Von Bober, as far as the, uh, you know, having a dream, you know, it's, it's kind of like, okay, did he have a dream? Maybe he had a dream. Was it, is there, is there something really buried there? So we did a lot of digging and actually we looked into Jonathan Carver, the explorer's journals, his uh, travel journals, so to speak. He has a bunch of them out there and stated that he never got as far as Land Lakes nor- that far in the northern Wisconsin to ever be able to put a deed on the property. That's what we found. Whether it got there by some other means, I guess it's possible. But there's also rumor that it was actually found and is in a uh, museum over in, I'd like to say, England. That's what, where they had reported it being. Some of the people that we talk to, sons and daughters of the people that have poured the foundation or stuff like that, had also stated that they can't ever remember anything ever being buried in the foundation. So were the Bober family, were they the last ones to own Summerwind? They were actually the last ones to try to make something of it. In 1986, uh, the people that we know now, the Tracys out of, uh, well, they actually have a lot of places all over, but mainly like La Crosse, Wisconsin. In 1986, her name was Babs Tracy and Harold Tracy. Well, Babs wanted something different for her anniversary in 1986. So what does Harold do? He comes back to the deed for Summer Wind. <laughs> That's a nice wedding anniversary uh, present. Uh, Here's a house. A haunted yep, one. Yep, here you go. It's, uh, I mean, it, it appeared in the 19 issue, 1980 issue of Time Life magazine as being one of the top 10 most haunted places in the United States. I actually have a copy of that, that magazine. Interesting read as, as well. So in 1980, it was already in ruins. There was no windows, vandals. When we were going up there in the 80s, kids trashed the place, had parties there, broke out all the windows, everything was graffitied. So in 1986, when they purchased it, they had it for a couple of years. Some of their stories of going there, they said that one night they went up to the property to take a walk up towards the lake, and they turned around and started walking back the other way because what they saw was the house looked like it was breathing in the moonlight, like it was inhaling and exhaling. They said they never (laughs) saw anything like that before. That's like out of poltergeist. Yeah, I would have been running like fast. And there's been many rumors of uh, different parties that have owned it through the years making repairs and remodeling that when they would measure one room one day, it would be a different dimension the next day. Wow, I've never heard anything like that before. Yeah. So they apparently didn't live in it because it was kind of dilapidated. It was dilapidated. They had a house close by, but they, they've been trying to do something with it for so many years that they just can't, you know, they haven't been able to. She just recently had a stroke. She is recovering and hoping that she gets better quick. have been very close friends with them for a long time now. Oh, that's too bad. Cause, so they've basically owned this for 30 years. Yep. Wow. And of course, what we're talking about now doesn't actually stand there anymore. Why don't you tell everybody what happened to it? In 1988, there was a fire. Well, night, yeah, there was a fire. 1988, there was a fire that burned it to the ground. It was supposedly been lightning that, that came in through the tall trees, the trees that were way taller than summer wind, and struck the house twice from what people had sensed, or at least what they had told us. 
Another story I have, I actually found a clipping from a newspaper article saying the town wanted to raise the mansion two weeks prior to the lightning striking it because too many kids were partying up there and getting hurt. Parties were out of control, drinking drugs, whatever else was going on there. And they wanted to raise the building because, you know, it's too dangerous. Mm -hmm. But when I talked to a fire marshal or somebody that was actually on the fire department at the time, he didn't want to give me his name. I can't give it out to anybody, but he said, basically, if you look into it further, it was a controlled burn. Nothing else around the house burned. It was just the house and there's trees all around it. So he stated that someone burned it down probably on purpose, um, whether they did it. He didn't get into it, but definitely wasn't lightning, I don't think. Yeah. So it makes you wonder either, was it the city took it into their own hands or with all the partying the kids were doing, did they accidentally start something on fire? But like you said, for it to be in the middle of a wooded area and not have it catch everything else on fire is kind of unusual. Yep. It, what's interesting, too, is Harold and Babs own this. So for the city, I guess they were trying to go through some kind of legal channel in order to tell them they would have to raise their own property. Yep, pretty much so, yeah. The, uh, the only thing that stands today are the two tall chimneys and the huge stone it's almost like cobblestone fire or foundation that supported the porch and stuff and the stairways going down on each side. It's still very pretty. You know, you go up there and you go up there to take pictures and stuff. And just the stone foundation, whoever did that, was probably done by hand with all those different stones put in there. It was just a, a great feat to see that as well. Now, has there been any um, reported haunting since it burned down or did that kind of stop everything? No, no. Um, actually, they've, the reports of hauntings have gotten, I wouldn't say worse, but uh, a lot more forthcoming as far as uh, the hauntings actually, what's the word I'm looking for, got more intense and stuff. People that would go up there would see things. We've captured a couple apparitions along with one team that I work with also as well, Northern Wisconsin Society up in uh, Rhinelander, Wisconsin, and they uh, have actually captured a apparition going from down below in the basement of the what's left of the foundation and walking up the hill, and they caught that on video. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. It was a dark, well, I wouldn't say it's an apparition. Well, an apparition, it was a dark shadow, but you could see it was a person of some sort. So when we used to go up there, we would get uh, just really cold spots, you know, weird phantom winds that would blow, but yet it was calm out. One time I went up there with some friends of mine, and it was one of those nights that there was a light mist in the air of rain, and you got out of the vehicle and you said, nope, we can't stay here. There was something that told us we needed to get back in the vehicle and leave. It just didn't, it, something seemed off about that night. <laughs> And you guys, you'd have like rocks thrown at you and everything. This is after it had burned down. So yep. something was throwing rocks at you. Yeah, we actually uh, had these tiny little rocks that were flying like out of nowhere. They'd uh, We started by throwing rocks into the foundation. A little while later, there'd be some that weren't necessarily flying out of it, but they were landing like all around us. Somebody tried to claim that it was crows dropping pebbles, but I didn't see oh. any birds in the sky. And I don't see a lot of crows usually at late at night. But uh, they were like landing, they were probably the size of a penny, landing around us. Some would land, a couple of them landed on people's shoulders and stuff like that. And it went on for like an hour. And I wasn't the only group that uh, had this happen. The other one from northern Wisconsin also had it happen to them as well. They uh, had about the same thing happening, and it happened for about an hour as well. We actually went to bed for a while, and in the middle of the night, two of the girls that were sleeping in the tent said uh, they had rocks that were landing on them in the middle of the night on their tent and stuff. So you actually camped out on the property? Yeah, we camp out there. We, we have a couple different events almost each summer. So this year we got three. Last year we had five events for the general public to come out and camp with us. However, they couldn't camp on the property. We had to camp at a campground close by because in the state of Wisconsin, if you have any more than four tents on that property, you have to get permits. Oh, gotcha. uh, just some weird rule. Mm -hmm. but uh, So we put them up in a really cozy campground close by, and they still spent the entire night investigating with us. And they actually took a lot of pictures of the guests on the events, and they captured things that were in their pictures that weren't there when they took the picture, like a guy standing by the fireplace that wasn't there. I keep trying to get these pictures from the, our guests, and I haven't gotten them sent over yet. So Yeah, it's like people get home, and then they forget. It's, it happens yep. on ghost tours all the time, too. They'll be like, hey, send that to me. And then they're like, yeah, they never sent it. And those events that we had last year, we had fifty about 50 people per event, and they were sold out in 48 hours. And the only thing that sold out faster last year was uh, Star Wars. Wow, so that's very yeah. popular there. 
Yeah, we even had a couple of dealerships that sponsored cars and shuttle vehicles for us as well up there. And what's amazing is the mansion isn't there. <laughs> I know. Yeah, everybody from all over wants to see it. Well, we would be camping there, and people would drive up from all over the place as far as way as Pennsylvania, um, Illinois, Indiana, Tennessee, and they all drive in. They're like, hey, can we see the property? I'm like, well, you know, this is private property. Are you on our event? No. <laughs> well, we kind of got to turn them away because, you know, it's, it is private property unless you have permission to be there or you come to one of our events through the society. Then we allow you to come to the property and hang out with us. So you and Joshua, and is, is his last name Chairs? Yeah, he is. So you guys decided to start this Summer Wind Restoration Society. What made you guys decide to do that? Just for the, the interest. I've had an interest in Summer Wind for such a long time. And all our friends, for some reason, I got people calling me saying, I had a dream about Summer Wind last night. I really need to see the place. I need to go. It's been a dream to open it as a, back into the, a bed and bre- breakfast. We actually got the original blueprints Thanks to Joshua, who picked them up. They were originally going online for like fifty thousand dollars, but he ended up getting a copy for like three grand, a lot cheaper. <laughs> yeah, much still, cheaper. He was nice enough to send me a copy pretty much for free and said, "Hey, you know, let's let's try to do something here." Us being in contact with the owners, they are willing to help out as well. They just don't have the whole amount to get it done. I'm not going to get rich off doing this. I'm just doing it because I love the mansion so much. Just restoring something is hugely expensive to actually have to build it almost from scratch. I can't even imagine what that would cost. I had a couple different uh, contractors, um, whatever you call the blueprint people that look at the blueprints. I don't know if there's a name for them. Gave me a couple quotes that were close to half of a million dollars Mm -hmm. to start, so... Yeah, I don't doubt that. And for us personally, we really commend you for that because I hate to see when these old buildings and structures get torn down for especially a parking lot. At least this one, that isn't the case. But I just love it when people want to restore something back to what it originally was. And there's a great history there, especially like you said, there might have been a president who stayed here. Oh, yeah, definitely. And uh, there's the owners had told us that there were and this might have something to do with the hauntings as well. At the end of their driveway, they have Native American burial ground. Oh, that's interesting, too. Yep. They got got the mounds there, so. That's really interesting. wonder if they're feeling a little disturbed. Yeah, we did a little, uh, (laughs) we did an investigation there, and some of our uh, team members actually slept there for the night, and I had forgot to tell them that they were camping on the mounds. The one guy reported in the middle of the night with his wife, who woke up screaming, that something was scratching on the bottom of their tent. (laughs) Oh, wow, on the bottom, not the side, underneath <laughs> Yeah, them. the bottom, yeah. I said, well, maybe it was a snake passing through or something. Now, Craig, did you really forget to tell them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> he laughs, ha <laughs> ha. One of the other times up there, up in the woods, around where the supposedly burial mounds are, um, we had two girls that we had put up there on isolation and they volunteered and we gave them a walkie talkie and maybe it's probably about 75 yards away from us to them and we said see what happens hang out in the woods for a little while so they were sitting there we put a camera on them a little while later we hear him screaming so we run up there hear a raccoon fell out of a tree and landed next to him (laughs) well that would scare me if i had a raccoon fall out of a tree at me but how many many times you actually hear that a raccoon falls out of a tree or have you seen that before not very often the funny thing is, while we were going over audio on the video camera that we had pointed at them, there was a voice right after Raccoon landed next to them, and after they got stopped screaming, there was a voice that says they pushed it. Oh, that is really interesting. Because yeah, raccoons yep. don't just usually come flying out from nowhere. Yep. We had some awesome EVPs from up there. Some of them you can find on our website, foxvalleyghosthunters.com. Some of the best ones was an EVP that we captured that said, Damn it, I'm being bad. <laughs> well, at least it admitted it was being bad. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I can say on the show, but uh, there was a, a time when we were walking through the woods there, too, and it was actually at the same time where the one said, damn it, I'm being bad. A deer popped its head out of the woods, and I, all I saw were its eyes, so it kind of freaked me out, and I jumped a mile, and we got an EVP that says, oh, my God, what a ass, and I'll let you finish the rest, but... <laughs> <laughs> So it didn't think that you were funny. <laughs> no, it didn't think I was funny. And one of the best ones that I've had on a ghost box session was it, when, while we were up there, there was a male's voice that came through. But when we asked who was there, the male's voice goes, a little girl dead is your friend. Mm. I'm glad she's my friend. You know, if it was anything else, I'd be like, okay. 
<laughs> yeah. Since you mentioned the ghost box, do you have a favorite piece of equipment that you like to use when you're investigating? I use a lot of REM pods lately. I like the real REM pod. There's a knockoff REM pod now that uh, I'm not putting a lot of faith in. I think it's giving me false negatives. I like the ghost box. I like I don't like the obelisks, and then I know you're probably familiar with the obelisks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm not big into them because my girlfriend had passed away in 2015, and I was able to communicate with her um, many times through the Frank's Ghost Box, the hacked Radio Shock Shack box or whatever, and I was able to communicate with her, and I could hear her voice, and even her family members said, oh, my God, that's that's her. And if you're using the obelisk, all you get is the computer-generated voice that comes through, and I'm not a big fan of that. You never know who you're talking to. I agree. I've always kind of thought the same thing with that, is that it's it's much less reliable, and it's a lot harder to use that as evidence, because already when you have like the, the shack hack that you're talking about, people will say, well, you know, it's radio signal, so maybe it's something coming across on the radio, but if you're hearing a voice that sounds similar to your girlfriend's, and we're sorry for your loss there, you, you would be more convinced that that is what you're, you know, you're talking to her. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I would say I actually had a nickname for her. So on the ghost box, I said, what is my nickname that I used to call you? Something that you would only know. And she goes, I am your munchkin. And that was her nickname. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I captured her. And what's really cool for me is when I wrote a book, The Wisconsin's Most Haunted, I'm working on volume two right now. But my girlfriend that passed away, I heard her in Rhineliner where she passed away. I talked to her at her parents' house where she passed away. I talked to her at my house three hours away in close to Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And now I moved up to Green Bay, Wisconsin. So I wanted to know if I could talk to her in three different places, meaning that you can talk to someone that you cared about and it doesn't have to be the place that they passed away. Mm -hmm. So I captured her voice again over here in Green Bay a couple months ago. So now I had verification that I could talk to her in three different spots, even though she never lived in this spot. Well, I've often wondered when we hear about spirits that are just at one location, you know, you think about the afterlife and it's like that to me would be hell if I was stuck in just one place yeah. for the rest of eternity. So that's nice to hear that somebody would have freedom of movement that way. Now you wonder if that's true for all the spirits or sure. you know, ghosts, if they have the opportunity to that they can go from spot to spot or are they trapped in a certain spot where something bad happened. Yeah, and not to get philosophical, but sometimes I wonder if you were a bad person and, you know, is hell a real place? We don't know, but maybe that is what your hell is. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. Over and over it kind of replayed. Since you had all this weird stuff that was going on up on that property, I was wondering if you ever had anything else that would fall into the paranormal, like cryptozoological type creatures or any UFO sightings, weird lights in the sky, anything like that? When I was up in Rhineland one time, um, driving up there to visit some friends, I had some weird lights that got so close to me in the car and went right over my car while I was driving. And I had the sunroof in my car at the time, and there was absolutely no sound. And I took a picture of it and show, showed it to someone else that kind of covers UFOs and stuff. I mean, he's like, you know, that you might have something there, but, you know, it's kind of hard to confirm. But I said, there's absolutely no noise coming from it. <laughs> the Summer Wind Restoration Society, obviously you guys have set this up so that you could accept donations so that people can help with the rebuilding process. This is a 501c3, is that correct? Yes, it is. How can people go about making donations to that? You can go on to the Summer Wind Restoration Society on Facebook. There is a GoFundMe for it. I believe it's under Summer Wind Restoration Society as well for the GoFundMe. You can find it on that page. Otherwise, there's links on the Summer Wind site. And I had not realized that you had authored Wisconsin's Most Haunted and that you're working on book number two. Where can people get a hold of that book? Um, you can get it on Amazon quite freely or come to one of our events. we got a couple summer wind events this year um, in June, July, and August that guests can come and I'll sign books for them if they're around for that in Wisconsin, of course. And where do you guys post the events so people can figure out where to go? On foxvalleyghosthunters.com and, and on Facebook as well. Yeah, always uh, anybody that wants to join our Facebook page, uh, just become our guest down there. Um, we'll add you to the page. We cover a lot of, we just got back from the Velisca Actimer house, so we've been all over the place in the last year and planning on going to Waverly in June here, so. Oh, very cool. Uh, we've covered Velasca Axe murder house. Did you guys have anything happen to you there? Not as much this time. I had a lot of stuff happen the first time. This time, the first time that little, the door in the kids' room closed on us and opened while we were there, and this time I didn't capture, at least while we were there, we were there for two nights, so I have a lot of video and stuff to go over. Got some decent audio, but two girls that were on our team 
said they saw this really weird bright light on the wall, and it wasn't car lights. It was like an upstairs bedroom, and they described it as a falling star that went in like a swirling motion. Hmm. Now, the only thing I can say is they probably might have possibly seen some type of orbs type pattern. Oh, sure. Interesting. I had a friend that I grew up with. She and her husband decided that they wanted to stay overnight there and they lay down in the bed that the parents had slept in, you know, and they got the little yep. axe hole in the ceiling right above their heads. I yeah. said, you're crazy. Yeah, we, we stayed in there too. I stayed in the bed in the kids' room and one of the other girls stayed in the parents' room as well. I didn't sleep too well, but I, <laughs> I did finally get to sleep. <laughs> And uh, Waverly, we tried to get up there to go through it, but we got there. They'd already closed down because we didn't want to go at night. We were going to go during the day. Oh. It sounds too oh, creepy wow. at night. <laughs> yeah. But it's a very cool location up there, and supposedly they got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you of a really cool time at Summer Wind. We were doing a ghost box session, uh, Frank's box, ghost box on the front porch, and we have meters up there, and the, there's no electricity you know, on up there. So our meters start going off, and on the ghost box we hear, go get them coming up the driveway, vindictive, hurry, run. And one of my friends are like, what's going on? And he's like, maybe I should go check the driveway, of the, you know, because it's a long driveway coming up to where the mansion would have been. So he ran up the driveway, and here there were three kids trying to break in the back of one of our trucks. Oh, wow. Yeah, and they were warning us. And uh, we're like, oh, my God, because they said three to one at one point on the ghost box, meaning three people. Uh -huh. And I thought they were going to push somebody off the porch. <laughs> Because, you know, three, two, one, you're like, everybody hold on. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, um, but it was like they, it was uh, counting them. Okay, there's three, counting, two, yep. and one. So after he caught them, well, they ran off into the woods and left. But we went back to the front porch, and maybe about a half hour later, we hear seven. Go get them now. Hurry. Run. Coming up driveway again. And they say it again, just like that. And it was a lot of that those voices were I kept and saved as well to show people that they were actually saying this. So I said, why don't you run up the driveway and check it out again? So the guy runs up to the top of the driveway. Here are seven people, five boys and two girls, wow. standing there at the end of the driveway about ready to come up. Because you guys are there so often, do you feel that the spirits that are there are familiar with you? I think so. I, I hear my name quite a bit. <laughs> Some of the ghost box sessions, even I capture all the time, even at various locations I I have been to or frequent in the past quite a bit, saying, we love Craig. Well, that's, I mean, I, the reason why I ask is because for them to be warning you about such things, if they didn't like you, I think they'd be like, oh, go ahead, break in their truck. We don't care. Yeah. Or, you know, the seven people, I am assuming they weren't there to do anything bad. They were probably just coming no. to hang out. But yep. it obviously wanted you to be aware that there were other people there and maybe they didn't want them there. Yep. I was up there um, last summer and I said, are you guys going to help find the, uh, anybody that's coming up the driveway again, again for us. I you know, mentioned that in the ghost box, and a voice comes back and says, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Continue. Maybe. Hang out, and maybe we'll give you something. <laughs> yeah, and I know a lot of the, you know, like I say, there's a big uh, controversy with the ghost box and stuff, but I get sweared at my very fair share on there as well. And you know the FCC doesn't allow no. certain words to come through there. So I know, I know when I'm getting, especially when I'm getting complete sentences, so. Yeah, and we're not real big on the F word around here, but I yeah. like it when I hear it coming through that stuff because, like you said, yeah. that is one word that definitely is not going to be heard on a traditional radio. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Is there anything else you wanted to share with everybody, Craig? Not too much. We did. Uh, we have some cool videos out there. I think the only place you can find them right now is on is at Vimo, V-E-I-M-O. Through U.S. Cellular, we did uh, commercials for three haunted locations. One was for our haunted schoolhouse in Iowa. The other one was... Uh, Bond Steel Winery in Wisconsin, as well as First Ward Schoolhouse, a haunted schoolhouse in Wisconsin that we uh, go to quite a bit. And there, you can actually find them on BMO under US Cellular in those, those locations. Cool. We'll check those out. I'd love to see what's going on. Haunted schoolhouses, those always kind of creep me out because you don't want to hear about child ghosts and such. Yeah. Well, very cool. Thank you so much for joining us, Craig, and we really appreciate this. I had not heard of Summer Wind, and so I'm glad that Joshua contacted us and let us know that uh, you basically sound to me like you're the expert on the place. Yeah, me between me and him and uh, Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society and Ryan Leonard, uh, we can pretty much give, give you anything that you need to know. <laughs> Well, and I love to hear you guys obviously love this property if you want to put forward the kind of effort that you are to get it restored and rebuilt. Yep. 
definitely. And like I say, we're not there to build a house for someone else, you know, for them to enjoy. It's a going to be a bed and breakfast where everybody can come and hopefully it will still be haunted. So Yeah, it would be kind of like uh, you're bringing back the fishing lodge, really. Pretty much, yeah. It also would be an interesting scientific study to see if the hauntings would still be there after you rebuild. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I can't really say much at this time because it's uh, it's kind of up in the air yet, but we are working with someone that uh, is a producer of many ghost hunting shows on, say the name right now, but he is in contact with us through Summer Wind. Well, you have a great rest of your night, Craig, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank you for having me. Thank All you. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. After hearing these stories and first-hand accounts of Summer Wind Mansion, it is hard not to believe that something unexplained is happening at this property. Is Summer Wind Mansion, or what is left of it, haunted? That is for you to decide. Well, that was very interesting. It's always nice to get first-hand accounts of people who've experienced hauntings there, and he certainly has had a lot of chilling stuff happen. Yes, he has. Very creepy. Don't think I'd want to hang out there, although it sounds like whatever spirits are there are kind of protective of him, so maybe not so bad. At least not for him. (laughs) On our next episode, we're going to be heading out to another college, and this one is in Iowa, Coe College. And we actually know it a little bit because our niece attended Coe College. Yes, and so it'll be fun to go to the small state of Iowa. This location was suggested to us by Zoe Timmerman. She will be joining us on that episode to talk a little bit about the hauntings that she's heard of there at the college. We'd love to have you check out our website at historygoesbump.com. And Denise, if people want to send us feedback, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And we received an email from Jeff in regards to Penn State University. The story, I believe it was my junior year in high school and my brother's freshman year at Penn State. Myself and a friend of mine went to visit my brother for the weekend and to attend a football game. While there, my brother had to do some study on Saturday morning before the game. My friend and I went with him to the library. My brother needed a book from, you guess it, The Stacks. So my friend and I went down to get him the book because after what my brother told me, I wasn't going alone. When we were down there, I went down one row and my friend went down the other, looking for the book. The rows were right next to each other. I heard a voice say, help. I thought it was my friend at first, but the voice was female, so I just thought it was another student down in The Stacks with us. No big deal. Then I felt someone poke my shoulder from behind, turned around right away thinking my friend was going to be there to tell me he had found the book. Nope, no one was there. Then I felt the cool breeze on my neck. After that, went to find my friend, told him what happened. He said he heard the voice too. He went looking for her but couldn't find her. And he told me someone tapped him on the shoulder too and he thought it was me. Well, we got out of there and I told my brother, go get your own book. Well, that is my story. Very creepy. And I really didn't remember about it until I listened to your episode. Brought back some memories. And we're so happy to provide that service to everyone to bring back your haunting memories to you. (laughs) The really cool thing about when we get these emails from our listeners and also when we have listeners join us on the show is recently we just rolled over 1.6 million downloads of the show, which is amazing. And we love that. But the really great benefit to that is that we have broadened our listenership out, which means we're reaching more people who've had different things happen to them at locations that we're talking about or that are suggesting locations where they've had something happen to them that's unexplained. And for me personally, especially as an open-minded skeptic, some of these stories are really hard for us to believe. And it's like, yeah, for example, when you hear Matt Swain telling you about Penn State University and some of the hauntings there, and he talks about it and says, well, some ghost lore associated with this university, it's easy for us to just say, well, you know, it's a bunch of kids telling the stories. But when we have a listener like Jeff, and Jeff has been with us for quite some time, it makes you go, wow, he had this experience. He's not just going to make that up. Exactly. And that's this isn't the first time that's happened. Like you said, this happens time and time again. And we've been getting more and more of those stories or more and more of you listeners who say, hey, I'd love to come on the show and tell you about my experience at that place. And it just it's it's really hard to be skeptical when you have that happening. Amy sent us an email as well. She says, Diana Denise, my name is Amy, Amy S. from Texas. I just recently found you guys while looking for a new podcast. As I hinted to you in my iTunes review, I clean houses for a living. It is truly my dream job, but can get a little lonely. I've been filling the hours at work listening to podcasts for years. I'm going to tell you a story that may be interesting to you guys. 
I think I started hanging out with y'all in late January of 2017. And I love how she puts it that she's hanging out with us. I was hooked the first day, literally. My other podcasts have stacked up for a lack of listening. I started at the beginning so as to get to know you, and it's been great. My lifelong friend Jen has been planning to take me to the wonderful world of Harry Potter at Universal for my 50th. She could not wait one more year, so we went on my 49th the week of March 12th, and that's her birthday. I did not listen that week, but when I got back to Texas and work, I started up again where I left off. Somehow it had glitched and played the latest episode. I was scrubbing a shower when I heard Diane start to read the reviews. She said, and we have this one from Amy S. in Texas. For a second, I was thinking, that's weird, another Amy from Texas. And I actually informed her, well, we do have another, we know for sure, Amy listener from Texas. I think we're going to meet her in a couple weeks here. She's coming to Florida. So she said, then my brain caught up and said, you're Amy S. from Texas. I immediately called everyone that would listen and told them all about it. Starstruck, go figure. But here's the kicker. Once I went back to see when the show was posted, wait for it. You posted it on my birthday. Okay, man, that is so awesome, I thought. Anyway, I have, since my early youth, been very sensitive to unusual happenings around me. I've also seen, felt, smelled, and heard many unexplainable things. Naturally, listening to y'all validates a lot of it. Thank you for taking the time and energy to open up your lives to the world. You both are a blessing. Well, thank you, Amy. And she did tell me she had some experiences she wanted to share with us. So we'll be looking forward to hearing about those. Denise, it's just some more of that synchronicity. People sometimes say our show's a little magical that way. Yeah, but it, it is kind of odd when things like that happen. I mean, what are the chances that Amy S. from Texas leaves us a review on iTunes, we read it and load the show up on her birthday? It's <laughs> magic. We're really psychic. And we knew that, Amy. And so we just did that for your birthday. If only we somehow would get the message of the lotto numbers. Yeah, I've been working on that one for a while. I can't even get one number. And Jen also sent an email. Hi, Diane and Denise. Let me just say that I've never been so excited for an episode until I heard you were going to cover Filipino legends. I just wanted to add, share a few things I've heard regarding the folklore. Growing up as bedtime stories, my dad would tell me and my brother stories about his childhood growing up in the Philippines. Of course, those stories included folklore, so you can only imagine how hard it is trying to fall asleep after hearing stories of the Capre and Aswang. According to my dad, to help ward off the Aswang from entering the home, the occupant would need to hang a mirror above the doorway, so when the Aswang would try to fly into a home, it would be so scared of its own reflection that it would just fly away. This might explain why our home had those Bakwa mirrors hanging above our doors. And like April's mom had told her, my dad also said leaving a broom by the door would help deter the Aswang from entering the house. There was also a specific type of leaf that you need to burn to get the ashes to leave with the broom. I'm guessing the smell of the burning ashes would deter the Aswang, and if that didn't work, the broom would keep it occupied. My dad told us to be aware of the skies while walking home at night because the Aswang may just pick you up and drop you off in a bamboo forest where you wouldn't be able to find your way out. This would allow it to come back for some dessert after having a fetus from a pregnant belly for dinner. I love the bedtime stories the dad tells. (laughs) Yeah, wonderful. He told us to carry garlic so the Aswang wouldn't take us and because we'd smell too bad. I remember going to school with a pocket full of garlic the next day. (laughs) That's a great way to make friends. (laughs) Especially when you start telling the stories and they all go home and have nightmares. Why why do you stink? Oh, because I have to carry this garlic around so that I don't have an Oswang suck my blood. There you go. Hearing April's story of how she got sick after stepping over an anthill reminded me of the time my brother had to see a witch doctor when he got sick after we played on our home's rooftop. He had a high fever, felt nauseous, and sores began showing up on his feet. Now, there weren't any anthills on our roof, but my family believed that it was something else that could have made my brother sick. Enter the witch doctor. The witch doctor took a plate, used a candle to singe the surface of it, and from the burnt areas was able to see that a spirit had attached itself to my brother, and that's what was causing his sickness. Blessed oil-soaked leaves were placed on his forehead, and using the same oil, the witch doctor massaged my brother to help the spirit detach from him. After a couple of days, he got a lot better, and the sores on his feet began to go away. Thinking back on it, there were probably other reasons why he could have gotten sick, but thinking the spirit could have been one of those reasons is pretty intriguing. I had emailed back in November saying my favorite episode was Ghost in the Bible, but I think this recent episode just took its spot. Y'all still accompany me during my drives to work, but I'm bummed I finally caught up and have to wait until a new episode comes up. As always, thank you for this great podcast and continue being your awesome selves. 
I love you guys. Thank you for everything. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, Jan. And that uh, legitimizes a lot of the Filipino legends that April was telling us. Who would have thought that we'd have two people out there who would have stories about witch doctors and being sick and that kind of thing. So, And we found some more remedies for keeping the capre and aswang out of your homes. And as I was cleaning the other day, Denise, I was going through my head because I was like, oh, gosh, I wish I could remember when I was telling April about that broom story. Where did I get that from? I know we talked about it on a show, and I'm sure it's when we were in the Carolinas. And sure enough, it's part of the low country lore. Oh, okay, Yeah. So I'm like, I knew I'd heard that somewhere. And so all of a sudden it came to me. You know, when you get older, Denise, it's harder to dig through those files in your brain. What files? (laughs) <laughs> just kidding we also heard from dawn hello diane and denise i have a new experience to share with you in march my daughter's grandfather passed away suddenly he was only 64 and was a well-known local drummer on the night of his funeral i awoke to hear music as if from a music box going off in my daughter's room i jumped out of bed to see what was going on and her room was dark and without any movement she was asleep as was the cat next to her the music box played two more notes with me standing there and then went silent I went to check the time and had a feeling it would be pretty much what it was, 3.15 a.m. All the craziness seems to hit in the 3 a.m. hour for me. I lie back down playing the notes over and over in my head, trying to figure out what song was being played. I came up with Amazing Grace as probably what I'd heard. I woke my partner up with, he's here, he's here now, he just visited Sam. The next morning I got up and started to tear her room apart looking for the object that played the music. I had assumed it was a music box. Finally I locked eyes with it. It was a doll with a handle on the back to wind up sitting on her shelf. The doll literally is holding a giant heart that says, you have a guardian angel. I checked the tag and sure enough, the song that it plays is Amazing Grace. I will enclose a photo. I still get chills and teary thinking about it. It's a very neat and touching story, but the doll part did creep me out a little bit too. Well, and Don continued, it didn't wake her up when it happened, but he made sure that at least someone heard it so that I could pass it on to her. To me, it couldn't be any more obvious that it was him and with a message that couldn't be more clear. When I told his wife of 38 years about this the next day, she said that she had a dream and he told her that he would be hanging around for a few days before going anywhere. I thought that you and your listeners might find solace in messages from those who pass on. Keep being the best podcast ever. Thanks for sharing that, Dawn. I emailed her back and said I love getting these heartwarming stories. You know, the creepy ones are great fun. But it's nice to get these heartwarming ones every so often, too, and kind of gives us hope for what happens to us in the afterlife, that we get to still see our loved ones and interact with them. Absolutely. And we have a couple of reviews to share with you. This one is from Moomem, five stars. Found this podcast by accident, and I'm so glad I did. Great mix of history and ghosties. My favorite types are from the Old West. Thanks for sharing that. And then we got another one from Canada, Denise. Oh, Canada. Missouri, I think is how you say it. Addicting AF, and I won't say what those stand for. Five stars. Thank you so much for your podcast. I listen to it each weekend as I wind down to my work week. I love the newish format and the different guests you've been having. Stay spooky. Denise, I remember we had one of our listeners, or maybe it was a review that said that they like the interviews and would like to have more of them. Well, that certainly has been happening. As a matter of fact, I believe I told you earlier here in the month of April, every one of our episodes, except for I think the last one is going to have interviews. I know it's been a lot of people (laughs) coming out of the woodwork. Yeah. So it's been fun having people on. We love doing it. It's a little bit more work for me on the editing side, but uh, I think everybody's really been enjoying that. So if you guys want to come on and share your stories and help share some of these locations, it, it helps us to have at least some eyes that have been on the place so we can describe it for people a little bit better. You're more than welcome to do that. Just let us know when you email and suggest a location that you'd love to be on and help us out. Thanks for joining us for this episode. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. We'd like to welcome new executive producer, Avery Lewis. Thanks. Fan of the show? Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast catcher. We would greatly appreciate your review at iTunes as well to help the show grow. Thank you.